Welcome back to Emergency Chaos, where we provide tips and tricks to help you become the best ER nurse you can be. Today, we're going to go over the most important cardiac conditions that every new ER nurse must master. Cardiac is a very important topic because it's one of the most important things that you need to master as the patients that come in very sick often have cardiac issues going on, whether it's their CHF getting worse or they're in cardiac arrest one of them right something cardiac related is often involved when patients come in very sick so as a new ear nurse having a good solid understanding is very important so we're going to review the important cardiac conditions we're going to go over the chest pain workup we'll go over chf afib rvr and cardiac arrest giving you the basics so that you have a better working understanding so that when you see them on your shift you can kind of put everything together and you have a solid foundation in them after the video, if you're looking to keep growing as an ER nurse, check out our ER Nurse Essentials book. If you want to go even further, we have our PDF Essentials Bundle and Complete ER Nurse Course. A discount code is available for the PDF bundle at the end of the video. Links are below. So, again, cardiac conditions are going to be very important. For example, when patients present with chest pain, you need to keep these at the back of your mind because these are going to be some of the deadly things that could happen. I've had patients that come in with chest pain, they look okay, and maybe an hour later, everything goes downhill and they get very, very sick. So by asking the correct questions, by doing the correct assessment and knowing what to look for, you can better help the team and figure out what's going on with your patient and overall uh, deliver better care for these patients. So some of the important cardiac conditions that you as a new ER nurse need to review and master are going to be congestive heart failure exacerbations, STEMIs, and STEMIs, the ACLS rhythms like SVT, heart blocks, and this includes third degree heart blocks, of course, ventricular fibrillation, ventricular tachycardia, aneurysms, tamponade, and of course, cardiac arrest. Again, keep this in mind, understand the basics of them, look them up, what are the questions you need to be asking, what are the symptoms that they're most likely presenting, what are the workups that these patients or these conditions usually have and the key treatment and the key nursing considerations for example what should you prioritize when the provider tosses all the orders in uh, what things do you need to keep an eye out for when should you be communicating with the team and what are the red flags that you have to again be watching out for so for the chest pain work when a patient presents with chest pain you're of course going to be asking how long has it been there is it on and off where is it at does it radiate anywhere uh, how does it feel? All of those questions are very important because they're going to help the team figure out what's going on. And with the time, you're going to be able to figure out the, what the most likely cause is so you can help them get better uh, priority in the ER. For example, if your patient is coming in with chest pain and they're also saying they have like a little bit of palpitations at the same time and they ran out of their medications and you see that one of the meds they were on was metoprolol for their AFib, you're thinking, oh, okay, they're having palpitations or having chest pain. Could it be their atrial fibrillation getting worse because they haven't had their meds? So all of these questions are going to be the questions you need to ask. But as far as the workup, the most important thing for chest pain patients is going to be getting an ECG within the first 10 minutes of their arrival because an ECG will help us look and identify any of the deadly things, right? This includes your STEMIs, your funky rhythms like SVT, AFib RVR, or any abnormality that can that is deadly and that needs to be uh, treated and uh, prioritized immediately. Besides an ECG, you need a Get a troponin. Again, troponins rise when there's damage to the cardiac tissue. Uh, you also need to get a chest x-ray. The chest x-rays chest x-rays will help look for other things that can also be causing the chest pain. Again, chest pain is not always cardiac, but just we want to keep those cardiac conditions in mind. But again, the chest x-ray can help look for a pneumothorax or pneumonia. Uh, Obtaining a chemistry can be important because it helps us look at the electrolytes, kidney function, so forth. A CBC is important. It helps us look at the hemoglobin, the white count. For example, if they're having the chest pain, a little shortness of breath, they see some infiltrations on the chest x-ray. 
um, and the CBC, the white count is high, it may point the providers towards like a pneumonia. And then other important things that may be ordered that you can anticipate depending on the patient's signs and symptoms can be like a BNP that can helps with congestive heart failure, a D-dimer that helps with uh, pulmonary embolisms and a CT chest if overall they need more uh, radiology because nothing's conclusive yet. Now, let's go over congestive heart failure. So the main thing here is going to be fluid overload, whether it's the patient not taking their meds, or there's a change in diet or just overall worsening condition. But the main overall problem they're having is that they have a weak heart and fluid overload and this fluid backs up into the lungs. So they present with increased work of breathing. Uh, they can be hypoxic. They can be hypertensive. Their legs can be very swollen and overall just uncomfortable, right? The most important thing when these patients come in, of course, getting them on the monitor, getting a set of vital signs. And for the treatment, it's going to be getting them on a BiPAP, nitroglycerin, and Lasix. So BiPAP, it's that mask, right? It's going to provide two uh, pressures. One that goes in and then a pressure when they exhale that keeps the alveoli open this constant pressure is going to help push that fluid inside their lungs back out into the vascular and little by little open up the alveoli and help them breathing better the nitroglycerin is going to decrease that preload which is going to make it easier on the heart to pump blood back out into the body and it's also going to help open up that pulmonary vascular decreasing that pressure so that there's less I guess, pressure being pushed into the lungs. So you have the combination of the BiPAP pushing that fluid out, the nitroglycerin opens up the pulmonary vascular, and the nitroglycerin also helps decrease preload so that the heart isn't working as hard to get blood out to the body. This combination typically gets the patients feeling a lot better almost immediately within the first few minutes after they're both started together. So nitroglycerin can either be sublingual, right? Or the providers may even choose to put a patch on or when they're very sick, they may end up doing a nitroglycerin infusion. So if you do do an infusion, just make sure that you have another IV axis, that you're keeping a very close eye on the blood pressure. I would set my blood pressure to take every five minutes because you never know how patients are going to react. I've had very hypertensive patients that are CHF exacerbations that get started on nitroglycerin. And after a few minutes on the first cycle, it drops a ton. So that's when you have to be on the lookout and let the providers know, hey, BP is dropping. Uh, too much on the nitroglycerin. I've been titrating it down, but it's still coming down. And it may just mean that the nitroglycerin needs to come off. Another very important med is Lasix. Lasix is going to get the fluid out of their body. Uh, and that's eventually what you want. But the Lasix does take a longer time to start working compared to the BiPAP and the nitroglycerin. So that's why you prioritize those two first and then get the Lasix right afterwards. Now let's start going over atrial fibrillation with a rapid ventricular response. So when these patients come in, they may have chest pain, They're, they may have a feeling of uh, palpitations, they may be hypotensive, they may be dizzy, they may be pale, diaphoretic, and so forth. The main thing is you get that EKG to make sure that it is AFib with RVR and not something else, and that you get a full set of vital signs. For example, if a patient comes in and their temperature is 102.5 and they're in AFib, and they also happen to have a fast, rapid ventricular rate, the providers are going to lean more towards the infectious cause, that this increase in the heart rate is as a result of a compensatory mechanism. And it's not just the AFib itself causing the instability. So they may go with like fluids, antibiotics, and so forth. But if you do a full set of vital signs, and the temp's good, there's no infectious cause, and the Patients hypotensive, tachycardic, they've missed their metropolar, they've missed their, their dataism, or they just, or maybe it's new onset or something. That full set of vital signs, that accurate set of vital signs helps the team make the right uh, treatment choices. So for these patients that are coming in with this, the treatments are going to be metropolar, diltiazem, and then if those don't work, sometimes the providers will choose to start a drip of the amiodarone. Uh, when they're very, very, very unstable and there's no contraindication, sometimes these patients do have to be cardioverted. Now, for the metropolar, the diltiazem, 
If the BP is already low beforehand, I would discuss with the providers starting a liter of NS or LR or whatever their preference is and having that going while you give the metropolo and the diltiazem. Theoretically, when slowing the heart rate down, the BP will improve. But just having that buffer as with the normal saline going definitely helps to prevent further decrease in blood pressure. Just double verify your dose of the metropolo or diltiazem, whichever one they go to. Give it nice and slow, see how your patient reacts. And then, of course, communicate with the team if they need to be redosed and if they need to be chased with a PO uh, version of the medication for longer control. Now, let's go over cardiac arrest. So how do you prepare for a cardiac arrest? Let's say that your charge nurse called and said, hey, there's going to be a cardiac arrest coming to your room in six minutes. That is extremely stressful. That is extremely overwhelming. I remember being there. But if you just have the correct steps down after you go through a few cardiac arrest it's all going to become uh, very repetitive and you're not going to feel that overwhelming sensation so to prepare the most important thing to prevent a chaotic arrest is going to be to assign roles somebody needs to know that their their main role is going to be to be doing cpr somebody has to be on their airway somebody's going to be starting an iv and being the one that pushes the meds someone's going to be on the crash car the provider is going to be the team leader. Somebody's going to be recording. That may most likely be you, right? Besides that, the person on the crash card needs to get the meds ready. Open up a few boxes of epinephrine, one of calcium, one of bicarb, and get a liter of fluids ready in a pressure bag. You need to su have suction ready and available. You need to have a BVM with airway equipment ready and set up, even with the ET tube. And this most likely falls on the RT, but just in case you call the RT and they're like, hey, I'm like five minutes out. I'm in a different floor, a different department. You need to just have that ready for them, the BVM with uh, airway adjuncts. And you need to ask your provider, how often are we going to do epinephrine and pulse checks so that you can take this mental load off of the provider and just keep times for them so that every, if it's every three to five minutes for the epinephrine, every, you're just keeping track and you're letting the team know, hey, in 30 seconds, we're doing epinephrine. And in 30 seconds, we're also going to be doing a pulse rhythm check. So you do this so that you can help keep times uh, during the, the code. Now, for during the code, it's... CPR, good, high quality CPR is going to be one of the most important things. Epinephrine, three to five minutes, every three to five minutes, and doing your rhythm pulse checks every two minutes or based on what your provider uh, wants to go on that route. You're going to be addressing the H's and T's, which are like hypoxia, hypovolemia. The T's are like toxins, uh, tension pneumos, and so forth. You may be giving IV fluids for the hypovolemia. You may be giving the calcium. The calcium helps the heart contract a little better and it helps with overdoses as far as a calcium channel blocker overdose the bicarb helps address some of the acidosis going on inside the body and defibrillation if needed right the rhythms that we're going to be defibrillating are going to be uh ventricular fibrillation and ventricular tachycardia without a pulse so when you do your rhythm pulse check and the patient has a v-fib on the monitor or v-fib uh or ventricular tachycardia without a pulse of course immediately defibrillation is the treatment for that i remember how hard it was trying to keep up worrying about making mistakes and constantly feeling behind that's exactly why i created these resources to help you gain confidence and take control faster our er nurse essentials book is your no fluff guide to essential er knowledge such as triage abcs advanced life support and the most critical conditions all in a clear easy to understand format our pdf bundle includes the essentials book plus our charting guide to help you document quickly, safely, and with confidence. You'll also get our scenario book packed with realistic, high-pressure cases to sharpen your critical thinking and prepare you for the unexpected. Use discount code ERREADY15 to save on the bundle. The course goes even further. It comes with book downloads, video lessons, practice tests, and if you need specific advice, you can always reach out to me. And as always, teamwork makes the dream work. And here at Emergency Chaos, we are proactive, not reactive.